All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning on, welcome back. Please like, subscribe, share. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Two parents just want their newborn baby to sleep better at night. They aren't overly concerned with why something works, just that it does work. For instance, they found that leaving classical music on during the night seems to lead to a better night's sleep for the baby. Even though they aren't sure why or how, they continue playing classical music each night. What assumption is exemplified here? So be careful, right? The question wants to know what assumption is exemplified. So what assumption, assumption is highlighted? Now, if you look at this, Right, And we say, well, we have two parents, they want their baby to sleep better, and they, for some reason, believe or found classical music helps the baby sleep better, even though they aren't sure why or how. If you were to look at D, determinism, well, you might say they're not being very deterministic, right? Because we're not describing a cause, because the universe is lawful and orderly, behavior happens for a reason. But the question wants to know what assumption is highlighted right? And determinism is not highlighted. So you don't want to pick D. So you want to be very careful in these questions. If you pick A, selectionism, selection by consequences, the learning history or the genetic history or the evolutionary history, we don't know what the consequence is, right? The parents don't either. So it doesn't appear to be selectionism. We don't even know if this is necessarily true. What the parents are doing, though, is they're being pragmatic. They are making the best decision based on the available information. And that's how you be pragmatic. You stay objective and you make decisions based on the information available to you. Right now, it seems like sleeping is better. So they're going to continue doing what they're doing. Parsimony says the simplest explanation. We didn't discuss if this was the simplest explanation, just that this was their strategy based on the available objective information. So the assumption exemplified is pragmatism. A team of researchers are tasked with analyzing the effects of a new arthritis drug on the behaviors of mice. The researchers conduct their research in a controlled lab setting and use multiple baseline designs as their primary experimental design. What branch does this fit into? Whenever we have a behaviorism, or I should say a branch of behavior question, you want to start thinking about, are we philosophizing and theorizing about behavior? Because if we are, that's likely behaviorism. Behaviorism is our theories, our philosophy. If we're experimenting, then it's going to be experimental analysis or ABA. If we're practicing, it'll be practice guided. In this case, you're experimenting. Researchers are analyzing arthritis drugs in mice. And so when you see animals, especially, you immediately should start thinking experimental analysis of behavior. This is what Skinner did in a controlled laboratory with animals. ABA, applied behavior analysis, is when we take it out and apply it to real world settings with humans. What branch does this fit into? B, experimental analysis of behavior. A parent wants her daughter to be more positive. She encourages her daughter to say positive affirmations throughout the day. Every now and then, the parent will reinforce the daughter when they hear the affirmation, but the reinforcement is unpredictable and does not rely on one specific setting or event. What is the parent using? So what do we know about the parent? The parent is using some sort of strategy. We know the parent wants her daughter to be positive, and so she wants the daughter to do it throughout the day, meaning it's got to generalize, right? Because if we're going to say positive affirmations throughout the day, it has to generalize to a lot of different settings and context. To make it generalize, the parent provides reinforcement, but in an unpredictable fashion. What strategy does that relate to? A, natural contingencies. So these aren't necessarily natural contingencies, right? Because the parent is contriving the contingencies. She's just disguising the contingencies. B, general case analysis. With a general case analysis, we are analyzing the environment to plan for generality. We're no longer planning. We're now implementing. What the parent is using is indiscriminable contingencies. She's disguising the consequences and disguising the contingencies so the daughter is not aware of when she will receive reinforcement. And then training loosely is when we vary non-critical aspects of the environment. This has to do with the contingencies, not the aspects 
of the environment. So the parent is using indiscriminable contingencies. Which of the following is not true about non-contingent reinforcement? We have a not true question, right? Be very careful, not true about non-contingent reinforcement, meaning three of these must be true. So A, non-contingent reinforcement should be given regardless of what happened with the behavior. That's true. That's what makes it non-contingent. B, non-contingent reinforcement is a consequent strategy. Is non-contingent reinforcement an antecedent or consequent strategy? It's an antecedent strategy, not a consequent strategy. Be careful. C, non-contingent reinforcement schedule should be slightly shorter than the average IRT of the target behavior. Yes, so if we have a behavior that happens every five minutes, our non-contingent schedule should be maybe every four, just below it. D, non-contingent reinforcement affects motivating operations. It does. That's one of the primary uses of non-contingent reinforcement to try and manipulate MOs for behavior. What is not true? Non-contingent reinforcement is a consequent strategy. That is false. An analyst is evaluating the effectiveness of an intervention to reduce a student's off-task behavior during math class. Instead of relying on the teacher's opinion or the student's self-reports, the analyst collects data by counting the number of times the student looks away from their work during each 30-minute session. What assumption of behavior analysis is the analyst applying in this approach? So we have another assumption question. So let's be very specific about what we know given this scenario. We know the analyst wants to evaluate their intervention. They're not going on teacher opinion or self-reports, but they're going by objective data and what they've observed. So when we're going by facts and objective data and observation, what are we doing? We are being empirical. Now, how does empirical compare to pragmatism? Pragmatism is less about data and more about just being practical and just choosing what works. So instead of just saying, well, if it's working, it's working, we want to find out why it's, why it's working and we want data and observation to prove it. Determinism say, says the universe is lawful and orderly. We're not talking about behavior happening for a reason. And selectionism has to do with selection by consequences, which again is not part of this analysis. The assumption that the behavior anal analysis is the assumption that the analyst is using is empiricism. You, a behavior analyst, after talking with someone at your health club one day, are asked by that person if you would exchange behavior consultation services for acupuncture as they are a qualified acupuncturist. You are interested in this idea, but is it ethical? The question is basically saying, is it ethical to barter your services? Can you trade your services for other services? And the answer is yes. Now, if you're going to barter and trade your services, you want to come to a gr an agreement with the other party. You want to get it in writing, and you want to try to make the trade equal. So, A, no, you cannot barter for services. You are allowed to, but you have to do it in a way that does not promote conflicts of interest. B, no, you cannot offer behavior consultations to a stranger. You can, because that's our job, but you want to make sure you do assessments and do it right. But if you meet someone and they need behavior consultations and you have time and you can do it, then there's nothing wrong with that. C, yes, as long as you attempt to equal the value of the other services to avoid conflicts of interest. As long as we're avoiding conflicts of interest where you aren't providing, let's say, 40 hours a week of service and they provide an hour or vice versa, where we can create issues, then this is totally okay as long as you're able to work something out with the other person. You are referred a client who is 10 years old, only slightly impacted by autism, and is typically compliant. You just happen to have another 10-year-old client with the same traits and characteristics that you've already written a successful treatment plan for. What should you do with the new client relative to the treatment plan you already have? This is a common issue in our field, especially for clients like this who may be low-impacted, who are compliant, who maybe learn well. There's a tendency to just take other treatments and treatment plans and apply it to this client, but that isn't how we should be doing things. Everything needs to be individualized. 
You should never be implementing treatments without an assessment. So even though you've already got a very, very, very similar client, that client is not the same as this client. They just aren't. So what do you need to do first a relative to the treatment plan? A, reuse the treatment plan since it is empirically validated. If after the assessment, you feel that some of the things you used worked for this 10-year-old and might work for this other 10-year-old, can you use them? Of course, right? That's what being technological is. But you cannot just take that plan and apply it word for word to the new client. B, take bits and pieces of the treatment plan verbatim and use them for the new client. That is a big no-no. We can't plagiarize ourselves. C, do not use any of the old treatment plan for the new client. You can use what you've done in the past, right? We want to be technological. We just don't plagiarize and we don't do anything without an assessment. So D, conduct a functional behavior assessment and then write your treatment plan for the new client. That is what you need to do. New assessment, then figure out what's the best treatment for this new client that is personal to them. Parents, after three straight days of their daughter refusing to complete her science homework, even when escape attempts are blocked, decide that they are going to intentionally allow their daughter to escape from the homework instead of preventing the escape, and then measure whether or not escape increases. This strategy would fit best in what analysis? Easy question, but don't let how it's worded throw you off. It's just one long run-on sentence, but it's a good reminder that we slow down and attack the question. This strategy is going to fit best in what, what analysis? Well, what are the parents doing? They are go They say that they are going to intentionally allow their daughter to escape. So they're going to give their daughter what they think she wants. And in what analyses do we manipulate consequences like this? Well, a functional analysis, right? This would be the same as a demand condition and a functional analysis. So this strategy would fit best where? A, a parametric analysis, a comparative analysis, a component analysis. Well, these three are interrelated, right? A parametric has to do with the dosage, of something, how much or how little. Comparative, we are comparing two interventions. Components, we have two interventions that are part of the same package. And then a functional analysis is its own thing where we are manipulating antecedents and consequences. And that's what the parents are doing here. So this strategy fits best in a functional analysis. A health coach is helping clients increase their daily water intake. The intervention consists of setting a daily water goal, sending reminder text messages, and providing praise for meeting the goal. The coach wants to determine which part of the intervention is most effective in changing behavior. To do this, the coach decides to first implement the full intervention, then systematically remove one piece at a time to see if behavior change is maintained. What type of analysis is the coach conducting? All right, back-to-back -back analysis questions. Might happen, might not. Doesn't matter. Each question is its own challenge. We answer the question, and then we move on, right? New question. What type of analysis is the coach conducting? We know the coach wants to increase daily water intake. The coach has a intervention that has three parts. We have A, water goal, B, text messages, C, praise. So this is all part of one package. Now, if we have all these interventions that are part of one package, and he wants to figure out which part is most effective, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use our component analysis. Remember, comparative would be separate interventions, but these are all part of a package. Parametric would be a single intervention, how much? And then the functional analyses would be determining function, which we're not doing here. So clearly, the coach is going to use a component analysis to figure out which one is most effective by implementing the full intervention and then dropping out one piece at a time. Which of the following answer choices would be consistent with the views of radical behaviorism? All right, another radical behaviorism question. What do we know about radical behaviorism? Public and private events are both behavior. They have to be considered as behavior. The only difference is they aren't observable. So if we look at A, both public and private events are behaviors. That is consistent. Private events are only different from public events due to observability. Also true. Public and private events abide by the same behavioral laws and principle. Also true. All three of these ideas are consistent with radical behaviorism. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.